Very good morning, it's Penuel the Black Pen. So yesterday I woke up to news that Prince Mangosutu Telezi of the IFP had passed on at the age of 95. I decided to send a tweet. Uh, little did I know that this tweet was going to trigger and upset so many people. And it led me to going to find three that I thought relevant articles that I'd like to read for you guys this morning. It is not all inclusive and I do suggest that you go onto at least Wikipedia to go and read up on the full story and life of Umango Sutu Mutelezi. The tweet which I'd posted uh, as, I, as I read this, it was 23 hours ago, uh, had 182,000 uh, impressions, 1,954 likes, 272 retweets, um, and 233 comments. My tweet had read, at uh, God Penwell on Twitter, say what you want, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi has been a titan in South African politics. Founder of the Inkata Freedom Party, the IFP, Prime Minister of the Zulu Nation, and a fearless leader all around. Rest in peace, Mkulu. I followed on about 12 hours thereafter, after so many negative comments that I'd, I'd received, with a longer tweet saying, I would like to apologize to everyone who was triggered by my post about the passing of Mangosu Tubtelez. My intention was not to ignore the controversy of the man and his legacy, nor to upset people. He was there with Mandela and co, founded a top five political party, led in the Zulu kingdom, helped found a tertiary institution and bank, amongst other things. He is in the Guinness Book of World Records for one of the longest political speeches ever. That is why I stated he is a titan in politics. My suggestion is that people who are in pain need to try to get justice for their losses and pain, and perhaps look deeper into why South Africans only seem to demonize white people when their own black people killed many. King Shaga and many other tribal kings and chiefs killed many, but are celebrated by the same people who hate Mutelezi, Furvut, British colonizers and others. There is a lot of nuanced hypocrisy and cognitive dissonance, and I suggest every hurt or triggered person must introspect and simultaneously research their own tribal history to unearth all the atrocities committed by the people they revere. Prejudice seems like it won't end anytime soon, but there are so many blind spots by so many people, and it seems you are expected to constantly only demonize those who killed those that you love, while you have no issue celebrating those who killed the loved ones of others. Introspect, research, gain perspective, understand the nuances, and find peace and healing. Lions rule the world, sheep get eaten. You are either winning or whining. And truly, no one really cares. Again, my apologies for triggering people. That was not my intention at all. Have a blessed evening further. At the time of me reading this, this was released at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening on the 9th of September. At the time of reading this, it had 9,600 impressions. And as I said, the initial post had 182,000 impressions. The articles I'd like to read from you are from the Mail and Guardian, the Daily Maverick, and the Citizen. These first two, the Mail and Guardian and the Daily Maverick, are recent articles that have been posted since the passing of Mangosutu Teles. And the Citizen article I chose, I believe, is from 2019, uh, speaking about the dark side of Mangosutu Teles. I'll try and make this as short as possible without going into the details, something that can be discussed on the side. Uh, and I will drop links to the article so that you can read them at your own leisure. And I'll drop a link to Wikipedia so you can read up on the full story and legacy of the man. The Mail and Guardian, written on the 9th of September 2023 by Paddy Hopper, IFP founder Mangosutu Telezi, has died. Inkata Freedom Party, IFP founder and President Emeritus Mangosutu Kacha Butelezi, who served as traditional prime minister to a succession of Zulu kings, has died. Telezi, 95, died early on Saturday morning after a lengthy spell in hospital. His death was announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa, who said he was saddened by Telezi's passing in hospital after being admitted for routine treatment at the beginning of August. Ramaphosa described Telezi as an outstanding leader who had played a role throughout South Africa's contemporary history. Telezi was one of South Africa's longest serving and controversial politicians whose remarkable career spanned five decades and traversed both the apartheid regime 
and the post-1994 democratic dispensation. An accomplished orator, historian, and custodian of Zulu tradition and culture, Teles was perhaps one of the most contradictory figures in South African politics, claiming to be part of the National Liberation Movement while also participating in the apartheid system. It was this policy of loyal resistance to the apartheid regime which placed him on a collision course with the liberation movement he claimed to be part of and at the center of the bloody conflict of the 1980s and 1990s. Telezi was born at Mahlabatin in Zululand in 1928 to Princess Makoko Katinuzul, sister of the then king Solomon Katinuzul, and Matohole, or Matole, sorry, Ptelez, the chief of the Ptelezi clan. After completing his school education, Telezi attended the University of Fort Hare, where he joined the ANC Youth League and was expelled for participating in protests in 1950. Shenge, the honorific clan name by which he was known, completed his Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Natal, working briefly as an administration cl clerk clock for the Department of Nat Native Affairs. In 1953, after a succession battle for the leadership of the Ptelezi clan with his elder half-brother, Mkelele, who was arrested by security police and later banished, he became Ingos. The following year, King Cyprian Kasolomon appointed him as his traditional prime minister, a role that Telezi was to leverage to build and sustain Inkata, and which he has occupied until today. In 1970, as part of its homelands policy, the apartheid government declared the Zululand Territorial Authority, which became Guazul in 1972. In terms of the policy, black South Africans were stripped of their citizenship and given that of the independent Bantustans, a move which was rejected by the ANC and other liberation movements. Telezi, who was elected as the territorial authority's chief executive, became the chief executive councillor of Guazul, a title that was changed to chief minister in 1977. Telezi founded Inkata Yinkululego with Sizu, the forerunner of the IFP, in 1975 and served as its president for 44 years until 2019 when it declined nomination allowing Velenko C. Nishabisa to take the helm of the party. Shanga consolidated his power at Guazulu as Guazulu chief minister, minister of police and minister of economic affairs with only Inkata contesting seats in the Guazulu legislative assembly situated in Ulund. Telezi maintained a policy of participating within the apartheid system while calling for the release of jailed ANC leader Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners, positioning Inkata as part of the broader liberation movement. But relations, relations with the ANC soured over, among other issues, the acceptance of Bantustan citizenship by Telezi and his opposition to the exiled liberation movement's policy of armed struggle and sanctions. A plan to incorporate townships around Durban, including Chesterville and Lamontville, into the Bantustan in the early 1980s was fiercely rejected by their residents, who successfully opposed the attempt to force them to accept KwaZulu government rule. These tensions escalated with the formation of the United Democratic Front, the UDF, an internal ally of the ANC, in 1983, sparking a decade of state-sponsored violence that continued into the early days of democracy. More than 20,000 people were killed in the civil war that was fought in Guazulu and parts of the Transvaal, and in which both the Guazulu police and Inkata militants trained by the South African Defense Force played a key role. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, found that the trainees were responsible for assassinations of ANC and UDF activists as part of Operation Marion, planned by Pretoria and Ptelezi's administration. Ptelezi steadfastly maintained his innocence of any role in planning or authorizing the killings and consistently presented Inkata as a victim and not an aggressor and as an opponent of apartheid using the approach of loyal resistance rather than a collaborator with the system. When the negotiations process between the ANC and the former regime began in 1990, Telezi rebranded Inkata as the IFP and lobbied for a federalist dispensation, allying the party with right-wing ones in a bid for greater self-determination. 
It was during this time that KwaZulu passed laws creating the Ingonyama Trust, which today administers nearly 3 million hectares of traditionally controlled land on behalf of the Zulu monarch. The IFP pulled out of the talks on several occasions boycotting the ratification of the 1983 interim constitution and threatening to boycott the 1994 elections in which it finally participated. In 1994, Telezi became an MP in the National Assembly and served as Minister of Home Affairs in the Government of National Unity under Mandela, South Africa's first democratically elected president. During this time, Telezi acted as president of the country on several occasions in the absence of Mandela and his deputy Tabombegi, inf infamously authorizing the month-long military intervention in neighboring Lesotho during one such absence in September 1998. Telezi was appointed to Mbegi's cabinet in 1999, again serving as Home Affairs Minister, but clashed with the President towards the end of the term over immigration regulations introduced on his watch. In 2004, Mbegi did not invite Telezi to join his cabinet, and the IFP leader retained his position as an MP on the opposition benches in the National Assembly, which he occupied until his death. During this time, Telezi became the chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders, a job that allowed him to maintain his links with Amakosi in Guazulu Natal, one of the pillars of his consolidation of power from the 1970s. After the transition to democracy, Telezi's relationship with King Goodwill Zuelitini, Kapegu Zulu, waned, as did his influence over the monarchy, which was funded and supported by the Guazulu Natal provincial government. In 2021, when Zuelitini died, Telezi, as traditional Prime Minister, was central to the process of naming and installing a successor, King Misuzulu Kazuelitini, backing him in the succession battle with his siblings. But in early 2023, the relationship between Telezi and the new king deteriorated after the monarch fired Ingonyama Trust Board Chairperson Jerome Gwenya and replaced him with Tanduise Msimela. Telezi had threatened to withdraw his affidavit supporting the king's defense of a claim against his assuming the throne and had mobilized Amakosi against the decision and the monarchy he had served most of his life. Throughout his career, Uptelezi ran in Kata and later the IFP with an iron fist, countenancing no challenges to his authority. Its founding secretary general, Smusiso Bengu, was forced to leave the party in 1978 and go into exile after clashing with Uptelezi over the party's direction. In 2004, Ziba Gianni, another rising star and modernizing force in the party, beat Ptelezi's favorite for the post of national chairperson. Lionel Njali, but also had to leave the party the following year. A similar fate befell IFP national chairperson Zanele Makwazam Sibi in January 2011, whose expulsion, along with her supporters, resulted in the creation of the National Freedom Party, the NFP, later that year. The IFP remained without a leadership succession plan for nearly a decade until Ptelezi stepped aside as president in August 2019, allowing Shabisa to be elected unopposed. Throughout his political life, Ptelezi went to great lengths to position the IFP as an opponent of the apartheid system and a victim of the ANC's aggression in the conflict of the 1980s and 1990s. In 2002, he went to court to oppose the release of the TRC's final report which found that the IFP under Ptelezi was a primary non-state perpetrator of violence and was responsible for approximately 33% of all violations reported to the commission. This is from the Mail and Guardian, written by Paddy Hopper. As I said, I'm going to drop this link in the description. The next article, and again, I apologize that these are quite long. You can read them at your own leisure, and I am reading them as fast as I can to make this video as short as possible. Prince, this is an obituary, Prince Mangosutu Ptelezi, South Africa bids farewell to a divisive leader whose resilience and contention helped forge a nation. Written by Cyril Majala on the 9th of September, 2023. Up to the last moments of his colourful public life, Prince Mangosutu Ptelezi epitomised the ambu ambiguity of his complex political career that polarised opinions and attitudes towards him locally and internationally in equal measure. Received and fettered by eminent statements, statesmen of the West, while intensified apartheid repression in his native country saw South Africa being condemned 
to a pariah state. Many freedom fighters, exiled or fighting on the home front, dismissed Teles as a puppet of the oppressors created by the despised Bantu homeland system. Despite the derogatory labels at home, Teles' audience was sought by presidents of the United States of America, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, then U.S. Secretary of State Dr. Henry Kissinger, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, and British Prime Ministers Major, uh, John Major and Margaret Thatcher, a longtime ally and friend. Similarly, across the African continent, he was received warmly by the frontline states that supported the struggle for liberation in South Africa, Mozambique, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. He interacted directly with key leaders, such as Tanzania's President Julius Nyerere and Zambia's Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, and many others, despite efforts by the exiled African National Congress to undermine his projection as a genuine leader of the oppressed black people in South Africa. By then, his global influence extended beyond the political arena. His vehement opposition to the imposition of economic sanctions against South Africa made him a darling of big business locally and internationally, where he addressed chambers of commerce as a guest speaker. He was received by Pope Paul VI and Pope John II at the Vatican, among some of the influential global religious leaders. On the one hand, he proclaimed and he proclaimed abhorrence of violence. Yet many who perished in the bloodletting between his Inkata and the United Democratic Front regarded him as the commander in chief of those marauding men of war and assassins. In the end, violence as a form of self defense became the excuse on both sides. Although Teles expressed regret that his followers had been involved in the violence that resulted in so many deaths, as high as 20,000 by some accounts, he maintained that he had never instructed anybody to commit murder. Military training The highest echelons of the apartheid security machinery, including defense, military intelligence, and the police, were instrumental in providing clandestine, highly sophisticated military training to a group of 200 young men who had been identified by Inkata leaders. When they were unleashed on Inkata's enemies on their return, they left a trail of death throughout Gozulu Natal, Gauteng, and Bumalang, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was later to hear when the killers applied for amnesty, citing political motives for their crimes. Although it was established that Teles had been aware that the then South African government would provide Inkata with capacity to defend itself, he maintained that he was not party to any decision to commit crime. Even when officials as senior as former Defense Minister Magnus Malan were tried for the murders allegedly committed by the trainees, Teles did not join them in the dock. The accused, including the trainees, were all acquitted. Melchizedek, Melchized, Melchizedek Zakele Kumaru. Among them was one Melchizedek Zakele Kumaru, Teles' long standing aide and former Inkata administrative secretary. In court, it emerged that he had been the key link between the apartheid gener generals and the trainees. All the arrangements had been made through him and in subsequent amnesty applications be before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC. Various headmen who pleaded for amnesty on the basis that they had a political motive as Inkata members engaged in a war against its opponents identified Ukumalu as the enablers for their operations. Investigations by the independent task unit that were established that was established by the democratic government revealed that the South African police had supplied Inkata with large quantities of weapons, providing further concrete proof that Inkata had been in cahoots with the apartheid state. Kumalo shouldered the blame, as he had done previously, when a massive scandal blotted Teles' standing as a freedom fighter and which bolstered claims that he was an apartheid surrogate. The then Weekly Mail, in a major Inkata Gate expose, revealed that Inkata had been funded by the feared apartheid security police. To Teles' eternal embarrassment, the newspaper revealed that the massive launch of the United Workers' Union of South Africa in Durban to counter the hugely popular Congress of South African Trade Unions had been a project of the apartheid government. Thousands were transported by buses and trains to Durban to listen to Teles' denounce economic sanctions and the work of ANC-aligned trade unions. Inkata would have the world believe that Kumalo had been solely responsible for an initiative of this proportion 
without appraising his leader of the origins of the slush funds. He apologized to Ptelius and stepped down from his positions. Many believed he had taken the fall for his leader. If anything, what happened to Kumalo and his grim persistence with loyalty to Ptelezi perhaps points to how the wily old Ptelezi managed to survive for so long while his many fellow travelers and detractors alike fell by the wayside. Inkata evolution. There can be no dispute about Ptelezi's centrality in the formation and evolution of Inkata in Kululego, Yesizo in 1975 and throughout its current form as Inkata Freedom Party. Inkata was him and he was Inkata. However, it would be untrue to say that he built the organization alone. His strong personality was overwhelming, and many like Kumalo opted to withdraw quietly rather than risk a public showdown with him. Among the brains that could not last the distance were Dr. Frank Mjalose, Dr. Spusiso Pemu, Dr. Ben Ngubane, Dr. Sipom Zimela, Dr. Kevin Woods, Dr. Ziba Chiyane, and Reverend Musa Zondi, among others. Dislodging Mteliese from leading Inkata against his will in order to infuse new ideas and approaches would almost have been impossible. Although he professed to be a Democrat, the reality was that Ptelezi was more in the mold of African leaders across the continent that he drew inspiration from. They would have looked askance at President Nelson Mandela's decision to walk away after one term as South Africa's first democratically elected head of state. Of course, for many years, Ptelezi would say he had been prevailed upon to continue as leader when he had wanted to give others a chance. When he eventually stepped down and became President Emeritus, Mr. Velen Kosi Nishabisa, who was elected in 2019 to succeed him, was supposed to be the face of the party. But it was Ptelezi's images <laughs> that were plastered all over the IFP's election material in the last local government elections. Even at 93 years of age, he was not about to sit back and enjoy the fruits of almost five decades of leading the party. The IFP's resurgence as a major political force in Guazulu Natal following the dismal performance of the ANC in many municip municipalities, particularly those in the former Guazulu territory, where the IFP had been strong traditionally, would have been particularly pleasing to, to Ptelezi, given the acrimony over many decades. Wish for Reconciliation Towards the end of his days, Ptelezi repeatedly stated his wish for the ANC and the IFP to reconcile before he died. He often reminded people that the ANC was also his home, as he had been a member from his student days at the University of Fort Hare, and that he still adhered to the principles espoused by its founding fathers. He cherished his relationship with former ANC presidents Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo dating back to the 1950s. He was proud of his role as a minister in the first democratic government under President Mandela and was particularly pleased that on 22 occasions the reins of the country were left in his hands as acting head of state. He felt his contribution was similarly appreciated by the ANC when President Tabumbegi, who succeeded Madiba, retained him in the cabinet when there was no constitutional requirement to do so. But the relationship with the prov provincial ANC had challenges, primarily because they were competing for the same constituency and violent conflicts of the late 1980s and early 1990s had torn families apart along political allegiances. More specifically, when the ANC targeted rural communities for electoral support, it initially encountered fierce resistance from traditional leaders who had been a pillar in the foundation of Inkat. When the allegiance to the late King Kuduo Zuelitini, whom the ANC accused Teliezi of using to bolster support for Inkata, there was bound to be tension. Prime Minister Dispute The ANC also disputed Teliezi's claim that he was the legitimate Prime Minister to the Zulu nation. His fervent critic, nobleman Numalo, published the seminal Gaja Mtelezi, chief for the double agenda, under the pen name Mzala. He argued that Mtelezi was usurping a princely Zulu title that he did not qualify for, as his father was not of royal blood. What irked Mtelezi was the book's claim that he was imposing himself as traditional prime minister to the Zulu monarch. As many journalists would attest after writing about him, in inverted commas, poppy cop, cock or balderdash, his favorite descriptions over the years, he missed no opportunity to clear his name. He litigated across the globe to have the book removed from bookshelves as he regarded it as highly defamatory. What he could not erase from the history books was the origin of his name among Usutu, the lies of Usutu. When his mother, Princess Makoko of Zulu royalty, 
was dispatched to Mary's father, Matole. There were already whispers that he was infertile. Indeed, for three years, there was no offspring. To the extent that when Teles was eventually born in August 1928, Matole himself expressed surprise and stated the news could be the usual lies of Usutu clan of his wife. The significance of this is that Teleze later assumed the chieftainship, although his mother was only a tenth wife, while Matole had other older sons who should have succeeded him, argued Umzala. Teleze contended that he was the rightful heir because his mother was of Zulu royalty and had thus become the senior wife who would produce the heir. Royal succession. This background is critical in the context of the subsequent battles between Ibtelezi and some members of the royal family who resented his role in the affairs of the kingdom, as was evident of the king's relating his passing last year and the succession dispute. His relationship with King Kudwil was often difficult, particularly when he was chief minister of the erstwhile Kwazulu government. Travel restrictions were imposed on the king and he could not be interviewed by the media without authorization by the Inkata government. Telezi also clashed with the king when the apartheid government's agents instigated the formation of the other political parties to challenge Inkata, which was running a one-party government with Telezi at the helm. When the ban on the ANC was lifted, it targeted the IFP's rural strongholds. Naturally, they had to win the king over, and he duly fell into the warm embrace of Madiba. The issue of the status of the king further soured relations between the ANC-led KwaZulu-Natal government and Ibtelez, who continued as traditional prime minister to the Zulu nation, even while he was estranged from the king. Up to the last days of his life, Telezi was still integral to Zulu royal family matters and had been taken to court by a faction of the family that disputed the king's will, which identified Queen Man Man Mantuombi as the heir. The queen, who also died shortly after her husband, had identified her son, Prince Misuzulu, to succeed her. Telezi wasted no time in saluting the prince and introducing him to the nation as the new king, with or without the endorsement of the ANC and the courts. He was wrapping up what he had initiated. For in reality, the current Zulu constitutional monarchy is Telezi's creation, notwithstanding all the difficulties between him and members of the royal family over many decades. Even in the twilight of his long, colorful and often complex life, Telezi was providing leadership when the monarchy was once again crumbling, this time not at the hands of the British invaders or Afrikaner voortrekkers who had conquered his forefathers, but his own blood relatives. Some decried his meddling, others admired his political dexterity in a moment of crisis. Walking a tightrope had, after all, seen him through many battles in his political life. He simply could not be wished away. Daily Maverick, an obituary written by Cyril Malhala. The last article I'm going to read is written by Eric Naki. Sorry, I just want to move out of the sun. Written by Eric Naki back in 20, on the 29th of August, back in 2019. Prince Mangosu to Telezi's highs and lows. There's a dark side and a great side to Telezi's leadership of the IFP. And I'm sure he's not proud of the former. Again, this is from The Citizen. The retirement of Prince Mangosutu Telezi after 44 years at the helm of the Inkata Freedom Party is a milestone in the history of the party. He founded the party back in 1975 and led it with a firm hand without any challenge, even under democracy, when leaderships had to be contested. But his was not a leadership covered in glory. One can bet that two people who came to know him at different times one before 1994 and another post our democracy could tell contradictory stories about his great leadership. There's a dark side and a great side to it, and I'm sure he's not proud of the former. On the good side, he participated in the liberation struggle, starting with the ANC Youth League and became an ANC member. The prince rubbed shoulders with the likes of Albert Lutuli, Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo. He appeared to have been closer to Tambo because he does not stop telling anecdotes about their early days and how the late ANC leader respected him. He will use every platform to relate his relationship with OR. While not implying that they had no cozy relationship, I must say it is difficult to believe Tambo would have liked a leader whose organization massacred many people in Guazulu Natal at Gauteng townships like Boipatong, Soweto and Togoza, and in metro trains in and around Johannesburg on the eve of their freedom. But if you listen to the prince like I used to, 
He would tell you that by rejecting the Pretoria prescribed independence for the Wazulu homeland, he helped to quarantine his people against being deprived of their South African citizenships. The Inkata, as it was known in its early days up to the 90s, until it tactically changed its name to IFP to cover its blood-soaked image, was an ANC project that went completely wrong. The exiled ANC hoped to use a Zulu cultural movement to spread its influence among Zulus, but it backfired when the Nationalist Party outmaneuvered the ANC and succeeded to Abteliazi change his allegiance towards the enemy. He was labelled inter alia as a sellout or impimpi and a puppet within the liberation movement. The then exiled ANC's mouthpiece, Radio Freedom, had a field day lumping justifiably Teliazi with other Bantustan advocates such as Keza Madanzima, Lucas Mangope, Patrick Mpepu, and Lennox Sebe, and their bedfellows from Kazankulu, Kangwane, Kwandebele, Leboa, and Kwako. All Bantustan leaders kept the people in demarcated barren land where eking a living was a daily struggle for survival, and they operated trigger happy police forces who harassed activists and opponents. Telles was so convinced of his power that he pulled out of the constitutional negotiation process at Kempton Park prior to the historic settlement, tacitly or tactically merely to extract some compromises from it. But he was forced to board hastily when he realized the freedom train was never going to stop for him. Until the very last hour, the IFP was excluded from the 1994 ballot paper and the IEC had to print a separate IFP sticker to insert it on the ballot paper at polling stations. We are just hoping now that Teles is no longer the president of the IFP. He will give space to his successor, Velenko Sinklabisa, to lead the party without having to look over his shoulder all the time. With a new title of Emeritus President, we hope the prince will allow democracy to reign in the IFP with regular leadership elections from the citizen back in 2019. Maybe let me go back. My tweet from yesterday. 182,000 impressions. Say what you want. Prince Mangosutu Telezi has been a titan in South African politics. Founder of the Inkata Freedom Party, the IFP, Prime Minister of the Zulu Nation, and a fearless leader all round. Rest in peace, Mkul. And my follow-up tweet, which I sent at 8pm last night. I would like to apologize to everyone who was triggered by my post about the passing of Mangosutu Telezi. My intention was not to ignore the controversy of the man and his legacy, nor to upset people. He was there with Mandela and Co, founded a top five political party, led in the Zulu kingdom, helped found a tertiary institution and a bank, amongst other things. He is in the Guinness Book of War Records for one of the longest political speeches ever. That is why I stated that he is a titan in politics. My suggestion is that the people who are in pain need to try to get justice for their losses and pain and perhaps look deeper into why South Africans only seem to demonize white people when their own black people killed many of them. O King Shaga and many other tribal kings and chiefs killed many, but are celebrated by the same people who hate Ubtelezi, Furvut, British colonizers and others. There's a lot of nuanced hypocrisy and cognitive dissonance, and I suggest every hurt or triggered person must introspect and simultaneously research their own tribal history to unearth all the atrocities committed by the people they revere. Prejudice seems like it won't end anytime soon, but there are so many blind spots by so many people, and it seems we are expected to constantly only demonize those who killed those you love, while you have no issue celebrating those who killed the loved ones of others. Introspect, research, gain perspective, Understand the nuances and find peace and healing. Lions rule the world. Sheep get eaten. You are either winning or whining. And truly, no one really cares. Again, my apologies for triggering people. That was not my intention at all. Now that I'm reading it, 10,500 views. So many things for you to consider in the three articles that I read. The contradictory, controversial Mangosutu Telezi who had led under three kings, Zulu kings, in KZN, who had founded as an ANC project, of course, because he was an ANC Youth League member, who was expelled for protest, similar to a Julius Malema, 
of the EFF who was expelled from the ANC, who was friends with some of the greatest ANC leaders, Chief Albert Lutuli, O.R. Tambo, Oliver Reginald Tambo, Nelson Mandela, who served as a member of parliament until he passed on, who was made president, acting president of South Africa 22 times and was made a, a minister of home affairs even under Tabumbegi when it was no longer constitutionally required to do so, who led with an iron fist at a time where even now, going into 2024 national elections in South Africa, many people are calling for a dictator, a benevolent dictator. There are people that herald the likes of Lucas Mangope in Boputa Tsuan and some of the advancements that he's made. There are people that herald, heralded the leadership um, of the Transkai and Siskai, those Bantustans then, some which were led by General Bantu Olomisa of the UDM. The UDM, I think, which was helped by some of the people that founded the ACDP. You hear of the United Democratic Front, which is also a project of the ANC. The people at the time who were trying to unite and bring their people together to say, we are a proud Zulu nation. King Zuelitini, before he passed on, had threatened to become independent, just as the Cape is threatening to become independent. And he wanted an independent state. And some people are still to this day crying for that, especially under Ngonyama Trust land, 2.8, if not 2.9 million hectares of land and what that means for the Zulu people. These are some of the nuanced things that people do not understand and you need to understand them. And if you've got a government, whether it's the apartheid government, whether it's the ANC government today run by Cyril Ramaphosa, or whether it was run by Jacob Zuma or Tabombego, or Nelson Mandela or Khalima Mutlante, you have got a leader of a Bantustan that is saying we are happy to work with the government if they will help us with military training, if they will provide the defense force and the police to help us strengthen our leadership. You look at Marikana, you look at life as Dimeni, you look at what's happened even under COVID regulations where the soldiers were enacted on the townships of the people, where people were killed. If you look at how the police constantly harass people in this country, how the police are failing to protect people in townships, in places like Alex, in places like Deep Sluit, Imlazi, Wamashu. If you look at the Cape, the Flats, or Kailicha, or Nyanga, if you look at Inkabi in Guazulu Natal, are they a legacy of Inkata, Yenkululego uh, Yesizwe, the IFP, that were trained by the apartheid machinery? The funding, the weapons that were given. People keep asking, why do so many taxi owners in Inkabi have guns? Where do they get them from? And even to this day, recently, months ago, years ago, we hear police stations reporting that guns that were taken as evidence are being stolen, where police stations are being held. Um, are being held hostage and weapons are being taken. These are the nuanced things we need to understand. I personally am not a fan of Prince Mangosu Tukhtelezi, but this is a man who has had a huge influence on our politics, on our history. And if you are just going to brush him aside as just one of the leaders at the time when there were fights in the hostels, especially in the East Rand, you know, of, of uh, Gauteng, in parts of KZN, Emma Hostela, Emma Hostela, sorry, at the trains, and you just isolate him to that, you lose out on so much. This is why sometimes I get called names when we speak about the apartheid government, their atrocities, the forced relegations of blacks into townships. But then you discount the state-owned enterprises they set up, ESCOM, that we're struggling with now with load shedding, under Hendrik van der Beel, Arms Corps, Sasol, ISCO, our metal, which we ended up selling to ArcelorMittal and so many others. We need to understand our history and the depth of it because it is not as black and white as people would have you believe. Even the passing recently of F.W. de Klerk, a very polarizing figure himself, who many worshipped and thanked him. He got a Nobel Peace Prize, which he shared with Nelson Mandela for bringing peace and democracy into South Africa. But others saying, but many black people were killed by these oppressors. He was the last leader of the oppressive apartheid government. But we need to understand the history without just being inflamed by Twitter comments and negative comments and calling people names. We've got Mangosut University of Technology, We've got the University of Zululand, where Umang Osutuk Telezi was the chancellor. Apparently, he was involved in the founding of Itala Bank, one of the last owned black banks we have in this country, even though last I checked, it was under the, the ambit of APSA. Itala Bank, of course, we had the Vendor Building Society, VB, VBS. We have U-Bank now that people don't know about. These are some of the things we need to speak about. A proud, passionate, patriotic Zulu man. And I can see why I saw Aaron's roots. Um, sending his condolences and sympathies, um, why they, they cherish a leader like Mangosutu Telezi. Adams Fansail also sent me a link from Afri Forum. 
which was saying they send their uh, condolences and sympathies because they are proud Afrikaners fighting for Afrikaans nationalism and Afrikaans pride. And they saw a similar man in Mangosutu Teliezi saying he was fighting for his people, the Zulu people, and saying the Zulus must be a force to be reckoned with. And he was ruling them with an iron fist. And even at the IFP, when other people were coming through to try and contest his leadership, his thing was, if you are not going to be in line with making sure that the Zulu nation remains king and remains powerful and remains led as it is now, then you will not take over from me. These are the deep conversations we need to be having as the country of South Africa, especially moving into the future, understanding our history, understanding the leaders, understanding the nuances, so that even if you have political ambitions, when you go to KZN, when you go to the East Rand, when you go to parts of Gauteng, when you go to the rest of the country, when you mention certain people's names, understand their history in depth and don't just speak from headlines and whatever was trending on social media. I'm going to drop links to the articles in the description below and I'm going to drop a link to my, to my tweet as well. I look forward to some of your comments. I look forward to some of your suggestions even. Maybe there is certain information that these articles also missed out on so that you can share, so that we can all learn, so that we can grow. We need to take stock of our country moving into the future and then we need to start drafting plans for what the future of South Africa looks like. Do we need to go back into separate development, something like futuristic Bantu stance? Do we need to remove even the provinces and have one South Africa? Do we need something new? Do we need to maybe even remove the borders? We have got great relationships with Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, you know, parts of Africa. What is our future looking like? And since we have the power now, we have lost these leaders. They've passed on. Nelson Mandela is no longer here. Oliver Tambo is no longer here. Umamu Matigizela is no longer here. Adelaide Tambo is no longer here. The Sisulus are not here. So, Mango Sutu Telezi, we've lost now. Other people, we're still going to lose. What is our plan now that we are in power to create a new legacy, which will be judged in the future, whether right or wrong, as you look at things like BRICS, as you look at the fights with the West and the East, etc. Choosing a side between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Pan-Africanism, as an example. What is our plan moving forward as a nation? And can we start setting up these gatherings where we speak about the type of country, continent, and world that we envision? Penuel the Black Pen, Penuel the Swart Pen, Upenueli Peneli Mnyama, Usiba, Olunsun. Have a great and blessed Sunday, and I'll catch up with you guys again soon. Cheers.